You are watching WBRC 6 in Birmingham, home of the Super Tower. Now, from Birmingham, the WBRC 6 Weekend News. Good evening, I'm Joyce Ebker. Terry Denard has the night off. The FBI is investigating allegations that a businessman offered legislators stock in a proposed dog track in return for their support of a dog racing bill. In a copyrighted story, the Birmingham News says former state representative Hugh Bowles has been under investigation for the last nine months. Brian Pia has more. This is the man that's being investigated by the FBI. Hugh Bowles is a businessman and former state representative. We wanted to talk to Mr. Bowles, so we stopped by his house. But his wife told us he wasn't in. Do you know where Mr. Bowles is? Yes, I do. Can you tell me where no, he is? No, I can't. We just want to get his side of the story. Okay. Well, he can't talk to you. He has been instructed not to. According to a copyrighted story in the Birmingham News, Bowles allegedly asked several state legislators to support a bill that would allow dog racing in the city of Bessemer. In return, the legislators say they were offered stock in Bowles' company that would operate the track in that city. State representative and businessman Gary White was one of the people Bowles offered the stock to. White was told that he could make an extra $50,000 a year from the stock deal. He made this offer and I was just... Um, I was speechless, and, I, and the more I thought about it, the more I knew that it was, you know, the wrong thing, and, uh, and that I went to the authorities for it. Bowles also contacted State Representative Johnny Curry. Curry was offered a similar stock deal, but he was never asked directly to vote for the dog racing bill. But Curry says it was certainly implied. It, you know, sort of left me numb, and it, you know, took me a few minutes to realize that, you know, I wasn't dreaming. This was real. Even though Bowles was unavailable for an interview, he has denied all allegations against him. But the charges have already taken a toll. The Bessemer dog racing bill has now been withdrawn from the legislative committee that was studying the proposal. The reason? Bad publicity. Brian Pia, WBRC, 6 News. U.S. Attorney Jim Wilson of Montgomery says the evidence that has been collected so far will be presented to a federal grand jury in the next few weeks. Lieutenant Governor Jim Folson adjourned the Senate today just before the chamber was to begin its fourth day of debate on a highway bill. The bill would take the control of the highway department from the governor to a committee. While the debate on that bill rages on, $61 million in state money that funds 19 state agencies remains undistributed. The House has already approved funding for the agencies. Governor Hunt called the filibuster a petty grab for power. The Senate will meet again tomorrow. It will be the first regular Sunday session in the Senate in this century. Birmingham Mayor Richard Arrington says that Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis is virtually unstoppable in his race for the Democratic presidential nomination. Arrington made his comments today at a state broadcasting convention here in town, and he says he is not undercutting support for Jesse Jackson. He says he will vote for Jackson as a, de as a delegate to the convention, but says Jackson is unelectable because he is black and because of his confrontational style. Arrington says he expects Al Gore will be the Democrats' choice for vice president. One area congressman is already assured of another term in Washington. While the filing deadline came yesterday, Tom Bevel had no opposition. Claude Harris and Bill Nichols face opposition in June Democratic primaries. Harris's 7th district is the most contested district, with two Republicans filing to challenge the Democrats. Jefferson County Representative Ben Erdrich has no primary opponent, but will face a Republican in November. Coming up on WBRC 6 News, we'll tell you how state troopers are better prepared to arrest drunk drivers. And this beautiful spring weather is perfect for the city's holding festivals today. Birmingham police are investigating a homicide this morning. Officials say a black male in his late to mid-twenties was shot to death in the 1100 block of 16th Street North. Officials say they're still searching for the suspect, who is also wanted for armed robbery in Michigan. He is said to be armed with a gun. The victim's family has not been notified, so officials are not yet releasing his name. Two men are lucky to be alive after an accident on 280 last night. This is how the car ended up after police say it struck a concrete abutment, flipped on its top, and slid south on 280. The two men miraculously walked away from the accident with only a few cuts and bruises. Alabama state troopers are intensifying their efforts to get drunk drivers off the road. As of today, officials say there are 30 additional troopers who are trained in identifying drunk drivers. 
The troopers just completed a program launched by, launched by the Department of Public Safety, and they will be assigned to posts across the state to help train other troopers. Officials say they hope the program will, will result in 20% more DUI arrests in Alabama. Troopers arrested 9,300 drunk drivers last year and say alcohol was involved in one-third of the state's 2,000 traffic fatalities. Spring is here and the dogwood trees have blossomed and that means it's time for many of the cities in our area to put on their annual dogwood festivals. River Chase kicked off its annual festival inside the River Chase Galleria. Hundreds of people turned out to listen to the music and enjoy the other entertainment there. The Hoover Festival was sponsored by the Birmingham Area Board of Realtors. It was certainly a nice day to enjoy other festivals outside. Well, what can you say about uh, the weather on a day like this? But mm, mm, mm. It was nice. It was real nice. And uh, the weather for tomorrow looks just about the same. Is that okay Thank with you, you, Dave. I'm okay. Good. Yeah, we're going to have another nice one on Sunday. Uh, we are expecting some uh, rain coming in here probably by uh, Monday morning. I'll tell you about that. And maybe some cooler weather also next week. That's in our forecast coming up. Dave Pilant's weather forecast is prepared here at the WBRC 6 Weather Center, a National Weather Service observation station. Well, it was downright chilly this morning in North Alabama. Readings dropping down into the mid-30s, just north of Birmingham at Pinson. It dropped to 36 degrees here this morning. It's going to be kind of cool again uh, tomorrow morning, and really the uh, weather on Sunday is going to be a lot like it was this Saturday. Check our uh, conditions. It got up to 78 for the high this afternoon after a low of 41 in Birmingham. The record high for today, 87, goes back to 1965. The record low is 32, and that was set in 1914. Our sunset time today at 713. No rainfall here today. 65 hundredths of an inch of rain for the whole month of April. That is below normal now by about an inch. 11.15 inches for the year is below normal by over six and a half inches. Temperature now, 75 degrees. The relative humidity is low at 22%. Winds from the northwest at 9. The pressure at 29.95 and falling. And as expected, we saw some uh, high-level cloudiness drift into Alabama this afternoon. And here's how it looks today over the uh, state. The satellite picture showing those clouds over Alabama. No rain anywhere in the area. Closest rain to us. A few scattered showers back in Texas. And these clouds are going to be with us again during the day tomorrow. We are going to see a fairly strong cold front back now in the Plain States move through Alabama Sunday night. Maybe Bring us some showers and possibly a scattered thunderstorm or two. At this point, it's looking like that would happen early Monday morning. And then the weather is really going to cool off around here by about Tuesday. Sioux City, Iowa, right up here along the uh, Missouri River, had a record high yesterday of 88 degrees. Cold front moved through there last night. They woke up this morning. It was 32 degrees, and they had two inches of snow on the ground. If you can believe that, there's where the cold front is now. Cold air, there's a lot of it through the plains and back across the northern Rocky Mountains. Even a little light snow going on around uh, Denver. Showers and thunderstorms are heavy in eastern Kansas. That light rain changes to some light snow up in Minnesota, around Minneapolis. They've also reported some light snow today. And here's some scattered showers back in Texas. Just some very light rain at this point. This is where we expect the cloud cover to be during the day on Sunday. Clouds once again over Alabama, pretty cloudy through the middle part of the country, but no rain anticipated for Alabama until in the early morning hours, uh, Monday morning. Here's the cold front by Sunday evening. By Monday and Tuesday, as that moves east of us, we're going to see some cooler weather here by the um, first and middle part of next week. But on Sunday, we're still looking pretty good. Highs in the 70s, but look how much cold air. A large area of the country will have highs on Sunday in the 50s and only in the 40s through parts of the eastern Rocky mountains all the way down to the Texas Panhandle daytime highs there tomorrow in the 40s. Checking out temperatures this Saturday afternoon across the state. It's 80 degrees now in Tuscaloosa, 75 coming in at Montgomery, Auburn with a 76. That's the same as in Talladega. Ganston with a 78. It's 74 in Coleman, 74 also in Muscle Shoals, and 75 here in Boymanham. Check the forecast for tonight. Partly cloudy, winds light, and a low this evening down to 47 degrees. Then the forecast on Sunday, partly cloudy, continued mild tomorrow with winds that will be light and 77 for the high on Sunday, 50 for the low Sunday night. Now here's the cool weather we spoke of 
for uh, next week. Still about 75 with showers and thunderstorms early Monday. Clearing up and cooling off Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. A high only around 60 on Tuesday. And still in the uh, low, maybe mid-70s by about Thursday with some cool nighttime temperatures once again. I think next week we're going to see some more readings dropping down into the 30s like we did uh, here this morning. Really? Yeah. And the, the farmers then will be looking forward to that rain that's predicted on Monday? Uh, yeah, and I think a lot of people should be looking forward to some rain because we need it. Okay, thanks Dave. Okay. Just ahead on WBRC 6 News, health officials say they've come up with a new way to try to fight the spread of AIDS among IV drug abusers. The Alabama A Day game is in the books. We'll take a look at highlights and much more coming up on WBRC 6 News. Health officials have always urged IV drug abusers to cut out their habit, if not for their personal well being, at least because of the high risk they have for the spread of AIDS. But now some cities are offering the addicts something new to help fight the spread of AIDS, and John Bascom reports. Drug addicts who inject themselves with hypodermic syringes have become the fastest growing group of AIDS victims. In New York, it's been estimated that every other drug addict has AIDS, over 100,000. Drug users who share needles also share the deadly infection. Now, some community groups are trying to help addicts keep their needles clean with bleach. Small vials of bleach are distributed along with instructions. In San Francisco, the campaign even has a mascot, Bleach Man. I've come to Earth with one simple but very important message. If you shoot drugs and you share needles, you must clean those needles with bleach. Bleach distribution is also popular in cities not generally thought to have an AIDS problem, such as Cleveland, Seattle, and Baltimore. Dr. Benny Prim, president of the Addiction Research and Treatment Corporation in New York and a member of the President's Commission on AIDS, says the best way to care for IV drug abusers is to get them off drugs. Barring that, he says, reach for the bleach. The second best thing to do is to tell them how to properly cleanse their, their works and that is their needle and syringe. And so a 10% bleach solution uh, has been found to be virucidal, uh, particularly for the human immunodeficiency virus. And as a consequence, people are handing out small bleach bottles with a 10% bleach solution and telling addicts how to properly use that to cleanse their needle and their syringe between uh, injections. The President's Commission on AIDS will consider proposals for bleach distribution as well as dispensing free needles. But Dr. Prim says giving away clean needles is not only controversial, but inadequate, since addicts can get AIDS from dirty cookers or cotton swabs. The handing out of free needles and free syringes is a far-fetched uh, uh, kind of solution to this problem. And we at this time are not considering that at all. Intravenous drug abusers are the biggest source of the spread of AIDS to women and children. In New York, 80% of the women with AIDS were either IV drug abusers or sex partners of IV drug abusers. A former addict, Annalisa Stardust, says she hopes other addicts get the message about not using dirty needles. I can only hope that the people who I know, who I did drugs with and who are still using them, are cleaning their needles because it's, uh, it's way too risky. Dr. Prim says from the addicts he sees, the message is getting through. We're seeing behavior change, and as more and more people die, uh, we see more and more people changing their behavior, responding to the message of not sharing needles. John Bascom, ABC News, Washington. Gay community. It's nice they had good weather for the Alabama game today, Lee. Yeah, a lot of people coming home uh, with uh, sunburns, I'll bet you. 51,000 in attendance, probably almost as many over at the Masters in Augusta. We'll take a look at that and a lot more coming your way next on BRC Six Sports. Just a magnificent afternoon to hold a spring football scrimmage. That's what Bill Curry's second Alabama team did today as the Crimson faced the white in the annual A-Day game at Legion Field. Our Carl Gill Tyree among the thousand at Legion Field, among the thousands at Legion Field for the event. Gill, plenty of passing, some explosive running despite the absence of the injured Bobby Humphrey. Oh, Ron, it was a great day out here. In fact, moments from now, we're going to talk to the Alabama new offensive coordinator, Homer Smith. He was pleased with the performance today. Over 51,000 out here at Legion Field for A-Day this afternoon. Let's go to the pictures right now. Highlights of this great ball game, crimson and white. You're going to see it was a phenomenal day for Vince Sutton. 
He was just fabulous. He'll find Todd Richardson on a 15-yard gain. That would set up a touchdown to Greg Payne. And this would make it 7 0 in the white early in the ballgame. Nice alley open. You're going to see Payne get the great grab inside the end zone. And it was 7 0. But the Crimson came back. David Castile, a 70 yard run for a touchdown. He's out of Eglin Air Force Base. You see him go outside and forget it. This is 75 yards with the screen. 7 7 now. And the crowd going bananas. You see Gene Junks just dragging him down at the end zone. And it was, like I said before, a great ball game here today. Uh, William Kent. Uh, number 30 had a super day today. He was running the football very well, but an outstanding effort turned in by Murray Hill, a 72-yard run, part of 15 carries, over 156 yards for him today. This is a touchdown to make it 14-7 at halftime, and it stood up with the white gone on to win by the score of 28-16. Again, Murray Hill on the afternoon, 15 carries, over 150 yards. A lot of people say spring games, who cares? But this man's going to care right now, the new offensive coordinator for Alabama. Homer Smith, you have to be pleased. Your assessment. I am pleased. After 10 practices, I was pleased that the, the offensive players seemed to go out and enjoy themselves. I was especially pleased with Vince Sutton because he showed growth today and poise. And it was, a good, it was a good football show. Now, our defense was under control. They weren't stunting. They weren't bringing defensive backs to the passer. Uh, and it's different when they do because they're so good at that. But uh, it, was a, it, was a good, it was a good milestone for us to reach offensively today. I wonder if people are going to say that, you know, earlier this week you said Jeff Dunn had the starting nod going into the season. Based on a performance here today by Vince Sutton, I would have to say it's up for grabs right now. He's, no one could say that Vince Sutton is out of the quarterback race after today. He, of course, he wasn't before. We've had close competition. Jeff's numbers coming off the scrimmages and the practice field sessions were a little better. But uh, Vince's numbers, if, if you consider the balls that were dropped on him today, were extremely impressive. Uh, it's a good quarterback race, but Vince obviously has gifts for that quarterback position. And my job is to get his feet solidly under him, figuratively speaking, uh, so that he can use those, those gifts. But David Smith was also impressive toward the end, and Jeff Dunn just couldn't play. At one point, he put himself into the game, which he had no business doing. Uh, he's hurt, but he's very impressive, too, when he's healthy. One final question. You have a lot to work with, a plethora of talent. Yes, uh, Gil. We have uh, a couple of more tight ends coming along behind Howard Cross. Uh, we have several excellent running backs. I'm pleased with the, the spread receiver core as it develops under Tommy Bowden. Uh, the line is surprisingly uh, good at this stage. I think we, we have all of the parts to be a very effective offensive team. Now, bringing them together is another problem. We haven't done that yet. Okay. Homer, thank you. Homer Smith, the offensive coordinator at the University of Alabama. Ron, again, the final number is out here at Legion Field. The white on top of the crimson by the score of 28-16. Uh, more highlights and postgame later on at 10 o'clock. Now back to you. All right, Gil. Great job. Now to golf. 45 players, those who survived the cut after two rounds of the 50th Masters in Augusta, Georgia, were in pursuit of Scotland's Sandy Lyle today in the third round. Lyle, the hottest player on the tour, came out breathing fire. He held a lead of two, then proceeded to birdie holes two and three. He bogeyed, and then he birdied number eight. This is approach to number nine, which he would par. He finished the day with a par 72. Still two shots in front of Mark Kalkovecchia, who is now joined at four under par with 18 holes to play by former champ Ben Crenshaw. Seve Ballesteros with a birdie at the 12th. This is Gary Hallberg's approach at the 10th. Well in contention to two under par after 54 holes. Our former winners Fuzzy Zeller and Bernhard Langer. They are joined at two under by Freddie Couples. What a start last night for the 1988 Birmingham Barons. Little Craig Grebeck smacked three home runs as the Barons opened the season in Greenville, South Carolina, routing the Braves 10 to 5 game 2 of the series and the season tonight at 6:15. Let's go to the Major League scoreboard. The Braves still looking for that first win of the year tonight in Atlanta versus the Dodgers. Cal Daniels slugged two home runs to lead the Reds past Houston 5 to 4. Philadelphia outgunned the net the Mets 9 to 3. My typewriter said Nets. And the Giants <laughs> down San Diego 3 to 1. Everything else in the National League under the lights. In the American League, Cleveland off to its best start in decades, defeated Baltimore 12 to 1. Bo Jackson homers, but Detroit rolls past Kansas City 11 to 4. Toronto shells Minnesota 10 to nothing. The remaining games in the American League of the nocturnal variety. And uh, can you explain that Cleveland start? I can't explain it, but it sure is nice to see. <laughs> I can't believe it. Sure it. Is hard to believe. A little disbelief, I think, among fans. That's right. Thanks, Ron. Okay. A very unusual high school experiment in Huntsville had students looking to the sky for falling seeds. 
The students from a Snailville, Georgia high school were at the Redstone Arsenal to launch a six-foot rocket carrying seeds into space. The rocket was designed to break apart when it reached an elevation of three miles, and then it fell back to Earth, trailing a 30-foot streamer to aid in locating the nose cone. The seeds contained in the nose cone were then planted beside control seedbeds to test for mutations and defects that may have occurred in space. There were a few delays, but it went off without a hitch. And that's our news. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you tonight at 10. The following is a WBRC6 guest editorial. Here is Angie Peterson, a concerned citizen, speaking on Does Jesse Jackson Really Have a Chance of Winning? It is no guarantee, nor is it written in stone, that anyone running for president has his name written on the White House seat before an election. When you cast your vote for a candidate, you are merely exercising your right as a citizen. Once you lose that right, you have no voice in any matters. All it takes for Reverend Jackson to win the Democratic nomination is to have enough electoral delegates and votes. The same applies if he is elected president. The Reverend Jackson has proven he is not only qualified to become president of the United States, but is just as qualified, if not more, than his competitors. He has proven he is electable. Please don't lead our young generation in believing that a single vote would be a wasted vote. Every vote counts. If Reverend Jackson doesn't stand a chance to become president, then this country's reputation is in serious trouble because our beliefs, our constitutional rights, our liberty and justice for all would be one big lie. The handicapped, the minority, the disadvantaged, and others would have lost hope in our land of the free, home of the brave. As it is written in our Constitution, all men are created equal. This has been a guest editorial presented to the public interest by WBRC6.